Thank you, John. Does everybody uh, see my main title slide? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Davidson, as John said. Um, sorry about the little technical glitch. Don't know if anybody else saw that, but um, I think we're good to go now. So I have the pleasure of talking to you all about landscape design this, um, this afternoon. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, just a brief outline. Um, we're going to cover a lot of material, and some of it is a little bit dense. So um, as John said, the, this is being recorded. So if you miss anything, you can always go back and rewatch it and find the part that you missed. But we're going to talk about what design is. Um, going to go through a very brief history of design. Um, I think it's important to know where these ideas came from um, to, to be able to be more informed into um, moving into your doing your own landscape design. And then we're going to talk about the tools that you need. So we're going to go through the, the principles. How do you start? What kind of styles work well here in Colorado? Um, and so we will go ahead and get started with all that. So first of all, um, the design process. A lot of people feel kind of intimidated by design. They think, oh, I'm not an artist. I don't know what to do. But if you really just sort of break it down, um, we're planning um, and making decisions about something for a specific purpose, a specific space. Um, so we're designating the location of elements and we're creating what is to us an aesthetically pleasing space. So this is definitely something that can be taught. Um, there's no doubt that some people are more artistic than others, but design can definitely be learned. Um, in my, I have a degree in landscape architecture and people came to that from all different backgrounds, some from fine arts, some from um, computer programming, others from more natural resources background. So um, particularly with landscape design, it can definitely be learned as long as you have the tools and the strategies. Um, it's important to remember that we're working with dynamic systems when we're talking about landscape design. So this is um, an area where it really differs from other static art forms. So, you know, plants start out small, they grow bigger, they die, die off, we have to replace them. So it's, it's an ever evolving, ever changing um, kind of art form. Um, when I worked at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, that's a botanic garden down there, um, <clears throat> I ran the horticulture volunteers, and we had a volunteer who every year would give a little pep talk and remind us that gardening is the slowest of the performing arts. Um, and so to be patient with ourselves, be patient with the plants and the landscape, and I think that's just a good reminder when you're talking about design. So um, another thing about landscape design is in, in how you do it is that we're just going through and systematically thinking about all the different aspects of our yard, basically. So we have to think about the land, the environment, again, those growing and changing plants, who the users are, who's going to be in the space, what the ecology is. And so you just have to wear different hats. You put on your designer hat, ecologist, horticulturist, your entomologist hat, and your homeowner hat. And you just sort of look at your landscape through all those different lenses. I think it's important to uh, look for inspiration. You need to know what you like and what you want. So the internet is a great place to look, um, magazines and books. Um, if maybe you have a neighbor who has a yard that you really like, um, you know, down the street and you think, oh, I wanna do something like that. You take pictures. So you have to get inspiration. And then you really need to identify what your wants and goals are. What are your objectives for the site? Um, you wanna think about what style you're after. Some people want um, like a very clean, minimal, minimalist, modern look. Other people really want like an English cottage sort of look. Um, and, and we can do those in Colorado. Then you have to think about the uses. Do you need outdoor play spaces, pet areas? Are you creating you know, an outdoor kitchen? sort of entertaining area. So you just think through all of those things. Then you go through what we call site inventory and analysis. And that is basically thinking through all of those environmental conditions and really understanding what happens on your site. And you're gonna apply elements of print and principles of design. And then you start to design. So boom, easy as that. Um, 
that might that might all sound like a lot and that's what we're going to go through today i'm going to break all of those down um but first we will talk about the history of design so you know if you go to school for this if you get a degree in this there are multiple semesters of history of landscape design and landscape architecture so like i said this is very brief we're just scratching the surface um, but i think it's interesting to see kind of um where it was where it's come where it came from and and where we've we've um, arrived today. So there are um, there is evidence of landscape design that goes way, way, way back, back to Mesopotamia. We're talking ancient Egypt, ancient India. Um, the the picture, the image on the upper right there, those are the fabled hanging gardens of Babylon um, and shows very intentional use of garden design and bringing um, greenery into these um, into these spaces where people were living and working. Um, the image on the lower left is from ancient Egypt and hopefully you can kind of get up close and see it, but it's very clearly a designed space. So you have a pond in the middle and you can see aquatic plants and wildlife. And then around the perimeter of the pond are trees. And we can see that they are um, dates, olives, and pomegranate trees. And so, and you can see that there's a pattern in those. So this is very clearly um, showing intentional design. And then on the bottom right, if we look at something like this, so this is a, you know, an absolutely amazing architectural feat, the Taj Mahal, everybody knows about the building. But the landscape around the Taj Mahal is also very intentional. You have the, um, the mirror pool that, that runs the length of those walkways going to the building. You've got those very columnar trees. And so the landscape design is, is created and designed to, to draw your eye to the building, which is really what is being celebrated. But the landscape design around the building is also very intentional. Um, a lot of people are very attracted to Chinese and Japanese design. Um, and some, sometimes people get confused and don't realize that there are actually some very distinct differences. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through those briefly and, and perhaps you'll be able to see those in these two images. So Chinese design um, is intended to be viewed from inside the garden. So walking through the space, whereas Japanese design is created to be viewed from inside the home. So you don't really go into the gardens as much in, in traditional Japanese design. Uh, in Chinese design, there's almost always a water element. If you can see, there's water there on the lower left. Um, and then in Japanese design, water is represented, but by patterns raked in stone. So a lot of people are familiar with Zen gardens, um, and they're often sort of wavy patterns raked into those stones, and those are meant to represent water. In Chinese, we have stones that are often placed on pedestals and, and um, placed really up high, and those are to represent mountains. Stones are also used in Japanese design, um, but they're a little more, they're kind of integrated a little bit more um, and used in kind of natural groupings, also meant to represent topography and mountains, but just in a different way. And then in Chinese design, plant material is left more natural, whereas in Japanese design, plant material is very manicured. So if you think about bonsai, which is just, you know, plants are just clipped and trained and, and very, very manicured. So um, again, these two design styles are very similar, um, but have some very different intentions behind them. And so that's the sort of thing that once you start thinking about landscape design is important to um, sort of have, have this lens where you can kind of pick those different things apart. Um, so then if we jump up to the Renaissance planting design, um, wow, that is a very designed outdoor space, right? So these plants are clipped to within an inch of their life. Um, this was when, historically speaking, um, people were really in this uh, culture were really starting to um, have control over nature. They started to cage animals. They would have birds in cages. It was a a sign of, um, of, of wealth and authority. And then these, um, they, they were doing the same thing with the plants. They were very controlled over the, over the plants. Not many people um, are trying to replicate this sort of look in their home gardens, but just good to, good to know about that one. 
So then if we zip through um, a couple hundred years um, and look at say arts and crafts, a lot of people are familiar with the arts and crafts architectural period. There's also an arts and crafts planting design period where um, the, um, the gardens and the landscape design was reflective of that era. Now we find ourselves more in um, sort of what we can loosely call naturalistic planting or water-wise, xeric, those sorts of things. And people are looking more and more at plant communities and what might be happening out in the natural world and bringing those into more urban spaces. So again, thinking about styles, you want to figure out what style is appealing to you. It's totally subjective. It's whatever you know calls to you. And so then we're going to look at the principles and elements of design. And these are things that hold true um, in, in all design. And in the, the Egyptian, the Renaissance, and then the more modern sort of naturalistic planting, there are these principles and elements of design in all of those, um, but they're just expressed differently. So these are the fundamental concepts of composition. Um, so like I said, you have these in photography, drawing, painting, and landscape design. Principles are guidelines that we use to arrange um, elements. They are order, unity, proportion, and repetition. And then elements are arranged according to those design principles. And those are line, form, texture, color, smell, and sound. Um, and this is the part that I was saying is sort of dense and I'm going to be like really cruising through a lot of it and it's not necessarily stuff um, that you have to memorize or, you know, like have a totally thorough understanding of otherwise you can't do landscape design. These are just concepts that are good to be aware of um, and you can always go back and, and review this kind of material to remember as you're um, starting your landscape design. So if we look at the principles. Um, Beauty, of course, is in the eye of the beholder, but we have these fundamental concepts of composition. So order is the first one. And um, believe it or not, humans prefer order, um, makes us feel calm, makes us feel in control. And we achieve this through balance. So if you look at the image there on the right, um, it's very symmetrical. You can see where the house is, that dark black outline is the footprint of the house. And then you've got that landscape design. So if we, if you see that red line through, that's the axis. And this design is very symmetrical. So what you see on the top of the red line is pretty much a mirror image of what you see on the, um, the bottom half. And that is order. That brings order to a space. However, you can also do it without being totally symmetrical. So we've got the same house, the same footprint, put the axis in the same place. Now you can see the landscape design is different. Um, there's more turf area, that green square, more turf area, and um, more large plants and open space on the top. And then on the bottom half, less turf, um, a few fewer large plants, and then more small plants. And so um, though they sort of, the two different spaces kind of balance each other out. And so that still brings that order to a space. The next is unity. And uh, so unity links elements and features, creates harmony and consistency, and often uses a focal point. So a focal point could be um, a sculpture, a bird bath, a specimen tree, a, you know, a boulder. You can use anything, but you have sort of a, a unifying point. Next, we have scale and proportion. So this is an important one. Um, scale is an object size relative to another object. So in landscape design, we're designing at the human scale. So we want to feel comfortable in whatever we are, um, whatever space we're designing. So in this uh, drawing there, you can see that there are things that are short and then a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and they kind of stair step up into the, the tall tree canopy. Um, now, this is important because if you look at something like this, um, the scale, the, the scale of the landscape plants and the landscape compared to the house is pretty off. So we have a large house made out of like heavy looking material, stone and brick. So it's just kind of a monolithic house. 
that's even up on a hill. You can see it's elevated a bit. So it's really big, looks really heavy. And then you've just got all these short little shrubs just down at the base. And then a few trees, but there's nothing in between. And so it's not a smooth transition and you don't really have that good human skill. Um, this is the reverse. Everything is either really, really short, or then you can see the tree trunks in the back. Those are palm trees. This is not in Colorado. Um, but those, those tall trunks just shooting up to the sky compared to everything being little teeny tiny. So you want to have things in between. Um, and the reason this is important is because if, if we walk into an a outdoor landscaped space and either everything is six inches tall we're gonna feel just sort of like giants and we're just kind of floating up in the air. And conversely, if we walk into a space and everything is six feet and above, and we can't really, we can't really see anything, we can't see what's around us, that kind of that would feel kind of uncomfortable. So you want to have that um, variety of, of sizes and shapes for scale and proportion. Next we have repetition. Repetition provides rhythm and sequence to a space. So in this image, we see uh, repetition in the material used. So that um, steel in the, the terrace beds, stair stepping down. Um, the terrace beds being stair steps. And then if you look over to the right, there are stairs being that, that go down. So those that's a repetitive shape. Um, then we have the boulder material being repeated through. So that repetition just kind of give, gives a rhythm to that space. Okay, so those are the principles. Again, let me go back, just order, unity, scale, and repetition. Next we have elements. So these are visual descriptors of features. So we have line, form, texture, color, smell, and sound. And so in this image, all of those things are happening. Um, and it's not necessarily, these are not things that you walk into a space and you think, oh, there's the line, there's the form, there's the texture. They're just things that if a space is designed well, they're just there and they work together well and it just makes this, the space look and feel good. So line is, uh, I think, a very cool thing, uh, a cool element. Line was very much used like with the Taj Mahal, as I said, that reflecting pool and the trees draw your eye to the building. Um, and that's exactly what line does, it directs the eye. So in this image here, the strong um, line of the turf to the pathway transition kind of curving around makes you kind of wonder what's around the corner. It's gonna pull you through that space. Um, if we look at this example here, when I look at this image, my eye is drawn to the fireplace, first of all, and then I notice that sitting area um, and that's a very active space. There's a lot going on there. But then if you let your eye kind of wander over to the left, there's a really um, sort of peaceful area towards the back with that fountain and there's a hammock in the back. And if you'll notice those uh, stepping stones that go back to that fountain, that is what draws your eye back there. And if those stepping stones weren't there, there would be sort of a disconnect between the spaces, but because that strong line pulls you back there, um, you notice the whole space. So hopefully these, uh, these photos are illustrating uh, some of these elements. Next we have form. This is the skeleton of a space, um, sort of the 3D structure. Um, and it can be accomplished through materials. So you can see uh, in this image, this is sort of a back garden, back courtyard kind of garden that's a, in a rectangular space. But you can see that um, they've used all these very curvilinear lines um, to give a different form to the space. They didn't have to just stay within that rectangle. You can also very much use form with your plant material, your trees and your shrubs. Next, we have texture. Texture is how coarse or fine a surface is, and that's gonna provide variety and interest to a space. Um, the, the vein patterns on leaves can provide texture. Materials can provide different texture. Um, you do want to be careful and not have too many different textures going on because then it can just look kind of chaotic and messy. Um, but if you do it the right way, it can work. So in this image here, if we're looking at the, the textures of the material, 
we look at the wood. So over on the, the right, that wooden bench, that color and material is repeated on the wall with the, the wood slats. Um, and so those sort of, that kind of ties into the repetition, the principle of repetition. And then if we look at the texture of the paving, the pavers on the ground and the stone um, wall on the right and then the concrete walls throughout, they're all kind of playing off each other and they all have different texture. In a small space like that, you would not want to be introducing too many more textures though because it would just get kind of crazy. Okay, next we've got color. Um, color is really, it, it's the fun stuff, right? When we go to nurseries and garden centers and things are blooming, you're just like, oh, I want that. It's beautiful, look at that color. Um, and colorful is a really powerful element. So it affects spatial perception, light quality, balance, and even emotion. Um, there was a study done many years ago now, but it showed that uh, most family fights occurred in the kitchen. And during that period of time, most kitchens were yellow, yellow, I don't know, countertops and appliances and everything. And so um, they were trying to see if there was a correlation between the color and the, the space and, and the emotions that were, were happening. So warm colors, those on the, the side of the color wheel with reds and yellows and um, oranges, are exciting. They're perceived as being closer and they can make a space feel smaller. So if you have a big space and you don't quite know how to make it feel so big, but you don't want it to be quite as open and cavernous, you can incorporate warmer colors and it'll make it feel a little more intimate. Cool colors, blues, greens, purples, do the opposite. They're calming, they're perceived as being farther away and they can make a space feel larger. Um, so, I'm gonna do uh, a little, um, not experiment, but a little activity with you all. So if you will go to your chat, um, oh, you can't go to chat, Never mind. Well, can you open the chat back up? I'm opening it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just saw that the chat had been closed. Um, so if everybody will go back to their chat, I'm gonna put two shapes up on the screen and I want people to write um, which color shape like draws, catches their eye first and kind of which shape their eye is drawn to. Okay, so hopefully everybody has found their chat and they're ready to type. All right, one, two, three. Wait, I, there we go. Which one? Where is your eye drawn, blue or red? Okay, interesting, I'm seeing a mix. I think I'm seeing more red though, but definitely a mix. Okay, thank you everybody. Feel free to keep chiming in if you want. Um, so the blue, what we see here is the blue shape is larger, the red shape is smaller, but still a lot of people were drawn to the red. So if I made them the same size, to me, now the red is just like super overwhelmingly like jumping off the screen and the blue sort of recedes back. So hopefully that illustrates how color can really um, be perceived differently. Okay, thanks everybody for, for doing the activity. We're done with that for now. Um, so color is a lot of fun and the co there's color theory. You can take tons of classes on that. Um, but for design, um, we look for landscape design, we look at a couple of different things. Um, some folks like to design, use monochromatic where you're just using the same, um, the same color, but different values. So that would be in something like this, right? These are all greens. Uh, the reason, I think this is a nice design. It's pleasant to look at. And the reason that it works is because, um, think to yourself, what do you think? Why do you think this might work? The reason is texture. There's a lot of different textures just in the leaves, right? We've got some hostas, some ferns, some strappy grasses. And so even though these are all greens, it's, it's an interesting little vignette to look at. Uh, another color palette that people use are analogous colors, and those are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. We often see it in plantings like this, like commercial plantings. Um, uh, typically people, homeowners don't really plant this way, but sometimes they do. So you've got the marigolds and then the coleus. But what most often we see are complementary colors. So these are colors that are opposite 
on the color wheel. So, um, you know, sunsets, the Broncos, blues and oranges, um, Christmas colors, reds and greens, purples and yellows are also really common. So complementary colors are um, what we tend to see most often. So here's an example of that. I think this is a really pretty color combination, the yellow and then the kind of lavender purple color. Um, even though it's a pretty color combination, to my eye, it's still kind of, it's a little bit boring. And again, that's because of texture. So that's all the same texture. If we look at those same colors, but different textures, you can see how it just pops a lot more and it's just more interesting to look at. Um, the little pop of orange in the background also helps the overall um, composition. But uh, even if we're just focusing on the foreground, that, that limey um, bright yellow and the purple with different textures stands out more. So that's a good example of what texture can do and color. Um, okay, and then our final elements, um, smell and sound. So these are things that um, are often unintended things that, that happen for people that they uh, either work out really well and they like or they don't like. Um, with smell, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we have, there are a lot of plants that are, have really great fragrances. Um, and so paying attention to that and incorporating that like roses, lilacs, and jasmine, um, there are also plants that don't smell so good. Um, but if you think of things like there's a native plant um, called chocolate flower, Rolandiaria lorata, and it is called chocolate flower because when the sun warms it up, it really smells like chocolate. It's awesome. Uh, and then sound. So you can, you can uh, introduce sound with something like a wind chime or um, ornamental grasses blowing in the breeze can create a nice sound. So thinking about what, um, how you can incorporate smell and sound. So again, hopefully you can look at this and start to pick out all these. So line, um, that pathway over on the right draws your eye over to sort of a seating area and then, and then up into the mountains. Um, often in landscape design, we'll use something called a borrowed view shed or, or a borrowed view. Um, and that can be accomplished by framing a landscape that is beyond your property, um, but you frame it on your property so that the tree, the two trees, there's one tall tree that looks like a spruce or some sort of evergreen, and then a shorter tree that's on the right. And it's kind of starting to frame that mountain view. So line, form, you can see lots of different forms, texture, lots of textures going on, colors, of course, you've got blue, um, oranges and reds and purples. We don't know what the smell and sound are, but all of those things are showing up even in that small little area. So if we start to wonder where this can be done, um, again, it can be done anywhere. You can have a big property, a small property, uh, a patio, even if you're just doing something with container plants, all of these principles and elements of design can be um, incorporated. All right, so now we're moving on to the next section of where the heck do you start? So you have the sort of theory behind it, but now what? You're looking out at your space and you think, uh, okay, I gotta bring in some line and some form and some color and some texture, but where do I begin? So the first thing you wanna do is a site analysis. You have to know what you're working with, what is existing, um, before you can dive in and, and do anything. So it's really, really important to sketch it out. You wanna, you wanna put a pen or pencil to paper. Um, doesn't have to be artistic. This is just for your record, your reference, but start to draw things out. Um, one, of the, one of the really important things we look at is topography. So high and low spots. Um, you need, that's important because you need to know where, um, where, uh, irrigation will drain or if we get rain where that's going to drain um, and you might think you're going to remember but it's so much easier if you just have a if you have it written down so topography is one thing to look at um, exposure you want to know sunny spots and shady spots you want to know what kind of soil type you have we recommend doing a test that's going to help determine what kind of plants you can plant um, we're going to talk about microclimates a little bit later, but microclimates are important to know about. So um, you'll have a microclimate on the 
or you'll have lots of microclimates, but um, for example, the east side of your house is going to have a much different microclimate than the west side of your house. East side has gentle morning sun, west side has hot blazing afternoon sun. So knowing about all of those things is important. And then determining the use areas. You have kids, you have dogs, are you creating habitat? Are you looking for a tranquil seat, sitting area? So figuring out uh, what's going on in your site analysis. So going back to topography, um, this can be important in for a lot of things. So um, if you want to try to determine the slope of your yard, if you feel like you have a pretty big drop off that you need to manage and figure out, there's a, a pretty easy way to figure that out. It takes it takes a little bit of time and um, some doing, but um, this can be key for if you're trying to redirect water somewhere or if you are trying to build in terracing. Um, and basically, um, slope is the measurement of rise or fall of the surface of the land. So it's the change in elevation. Um, slope is typically described as a percentage. And the equation, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through how to do this, and I have an example on the next slide of how to figure it out. But your percent slope is the rise divided by the run and then multiplied by 100. To, to get the percentage. So the rise is that change in elevation and the run is the distance. So you can do this with some, some simple materials. You know, people, they're like little charts and stuff that you can print out and you can hold it up and try to eyeball it, you know, get the right angle. Um, but you can also pretty easily just do it yourself. So if you have two stakes, um, some cord, string, twine, rope, something like that, a hanging bubble level is really helpful and then a tape measure. That's that's kind of the basics of what you need to figure out slope. What you do is um, you're going to drive those sticks into the ground or those stakes into the ground, um, one on the high spot and one on the low spot. And then you run a string between those two stakes. You use your level to make sure that the string is even. And then you can start doing your measurements and your calculations. So you can see the image there. Um, can, can you see, John, can you see my mouse, my cursor, if I'm yes. moving it on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So here would be the high spot stake, and here would be the low spot stake. So obviously the low spot stake needs to be taller. So what you do is you measure from the ground up to the, the rope or string on both of those. And the difference in those two numbers is what we call the rise or the change in elevation. And then the, the distance from stake to stake is the run. So I said rise divided by run. Um, so those are the measurements that you take and that's how you figure out your slope. So what you would do is um, you take height B, which is gonna be taller minus height A, which is shorter divided by the distance. So I have these simple numbers here. So if this is five feet and this one is two feet, we take five minus two, that gives us three feet change in elevation. We take three feet divided by the run. So the distance from stake to stake, that gives us 0.1. And then to get that into a percentage, you multiply it by hundred and that would be a 10% slope. So hopefully that makes sense. And a 10% slope is, is pretty steep. That's a lot. Most yards aren't gonna have that sort of thing. Um, but um, some yards, some people definitely have situations where they need to figure this kind of thing out. So that's, that's a simple way to go about that. So again, putting pencil to paper is really gonna save you a lot of time. It's gonna save you money. Um, you're, you're gonna just be probably be more successful from the get-go, which is what we want, right? We wanna be successful here. So um, creating that site inventory sketch, create some functional diagrams, figure out, you know, does the dog cut a path through here all the time? You gotta figure out if you wanna work with that or try to change their course, which is very, very hard. Sometimes it's better to just design that in. Um, and then create draft designs with different ideas, you know, um, try having the, the kid play area over in this space and your patio and hot tub area over here and then try swapping them, see what it's like and just sort of think through the different, the different options. 
um, again, with that pencil to paper thing and really taking into consideration all the all the users and all that is so important. Here's an example. You've got the design, right? The landscape architect said, oh, we want people to walk here on this pathway, but you can see what the people are doing. They're like, no, I can just cut across here. It's gonna save me, you know, 10 steps or whatever. So we see this sort of thing all the time. Um, here's another really great example of this. This is the uh, Mon Montana State University campus. Um, I think they might call this the quad or something. Um, but you can see if you look at those sidewalks, they're going at some pretty funky angles, right? So um, what the landscape architects did, they knew that they were going to be redoing these areas. And so they, after um, a few consecutive snowstorms, get a lot of snow in Montana, they went up on the roof and, and looked at where faculty, staff, and students were walking when they couldn't tell where the sidewalk was. And they did it a, a handful of times. And just about every time the pathways were in exactly the same spot. And so when they redid this area, they put the sidewalks where those people were already gonna be walking anyway. Um, and it cut down on those little, you know, cut across trails where you get compacted soil and the grass doesn't grow and then it doesn't look so good. So you can do that sort of thing in your yard too. Um, and it can make, make it a big difference. I have a friend actually in Austin, um, who she had a mysterious pa mysterious path show up in her yard. She couldn't figure out what it was. Thought maybe an animal was coming in and out. Um, it was in her front yard. She was home one day and realized that the mail carrier person had cut a path through her yard. Um, you know, you could get kind of upset about that and think, oh, he's sort of trash in my area. But she was redoing her front yard, and so she created a little pathway for the mail carrier. So. Um, you can, you can work with it, which I think is kind of fun to, to remember that you have that flexibility because it's your space. Okay, so applying these elements, principles, and site analysis. So you can see we're just building on, on what we do. So um, we're basically creating abstractions of nature. It can be very formal. It can be very clean. It can be kind of naturalistic. It's up to you. Um, some people that are new to um, well, that are new to Colorado or just new to landscaping and landscape design kind of wonder, well, what works here? What's appropriate? Um, you can do anything here, really, but some that really lend themselves well to Colorado are stereoscaping or water-wise gardens, rock gardens, creating wildlife habitat. Um, and then I'm going to go a little bit into some rain gardens and rainwater harvesting stuff. So if you're looking at xeriscaping, there are seven principles of xeriscaping. Um, I'm not going to go through all that. That's something that you can check out. But xeriscaping does not mean zero scaping, does not mean rocks and rocks and more rocks and maybe a cactus. Uh, it just means being conscientious of your plant palette and how you use your irrigation. But this is a water-wise garden design. Same thing here. You can see full of plants, but not really water intensive. That's the water wise garden at, at Denver Botanic Gardens. You can see beautiful flowers blooming like crazy. Um, this is the demonstration garden at the extension office here in Boulder County. Uh, we also have a rock garden here. So I'm just giving you kind of some different ideas of, of things that can be done here. This is a native plant garden. You can attract wildlife, pollinators, songbirds. So whatever kind of landscape design style plant palette you choose to do, um, the idea of an integrated design is a really great one. Um, and this is based, it's a design strategy that maximizes the potential of a site by creating an efficient design that saves resources and improves the function and sustainability of the site. So um, another way to think of that is stacking footprints. Uh, excuse me, stacking functions, and that gives your space sort of a, a lighter footprint and you can stretch out your resources. So um, if you think about where you're locating your trees, if you have deciduous trees that shade your house in the summer, that can cut down on your air conditioning bill. Um, and then they'll lose their leaves in the winter time, and then they'll let the sunlight into your house and you'll get that solar gain and that can cut down on your heating costs. And so just thinking through all of those elements, you can really figure out how to, to make your site work for you. 
Okay, I'm going to briefly go through some rainwater harvesting ideas and then we're going to talk about some um, some plants. So, uh, and I know we have, I'm checking my time, we got about 15 minutes left, so I've got to go fast. I have a hard time squishing this um, topic down, so um, I, know, I know that there's a lot that we're covering, but um, so there's active rainwater harvesting, that's capturing rainwater in a container or a rain barrel for later use. And then there's passive rainwater harvesting, um, which you see on the right, and that's where you divert water over land to vegetated areas to use immediately. And instead of tank storage, you can think of it as soil storage. So this is making sure that you're getting water into the ground rather than it running off your property into the road, into the storm drain, and um, just not, not getting back into the watershed and the water cycle. So another word for uh, passive rainwater harvesting is green infrastructure. You may have heard that term. Our goal with um, passive water harvesting is we're trying to slow the water down, we're trying to spread it out and then sink it, get it into the ground. So um, this can be integrated into your landscape through swales, berms, French drains and rain gardens. Um, so first step is figuring out how water moves on your property. Um, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we're gonna get some rain next week. Uh, that's what the for forecast says. Um, on the front range anyway, where I am, I realize people might be um, watching from other areas. But um, if this is the case, if we do get some water, look out your window, step outside and see. It's a perfect time to see where water is moving on your property. And then you can work with that. And that, that can become part of your site analysis. Um, so a swale is a feature that moves water. Um, it spreads, so we're trying to slow spread and sink. Swales spread water horizontally. So you can see in this image, it looks like, you know, we might call this a dry creek bed. A lot of times people will put that into their landscape as just sort of an aesthetic feature. But if you can actually activate that, and when we get um, precipitation, if that turns into an actual um, water moving swale, then that's a bonus and you can have it go to another part of your yard. So you might imagine um, maybe up by the house, there's a downspout right over here uh, and, it, and you're moving your water through that swale. You do wanna be careful about where you direct water. Um, you don't want it to go into your neighbor's property. Uh, if you've got, so I don't know if you can tell, but maybe by the stair steps, you can tell that there's a pretty significant slope here. Um, and again, if you look at my cursor, you can see they have a swale that kind of curves around and then it, it stops and dumps right here. And the idea there, I'm sure, is that they're trying to sink a bunch of that water uh, into the root zone area of that tree. But you do want to be careful where you direct it. Don't want to cause issues for your neighbor or have it go right to your foundation or something like that. Next, we have berms. Berms um, slow water down and they're just raised areas um, of soil and plants. And you want to make sure if you do a berm that you have a smooth um, transition from the existing grade of the ground to your berm. So you don't want that sharp um, angle like that. You want it to be nice and smooth. If, you if it's too sharp like this and you have water coming in quickly, um, it'll start to undercut and erode that. But if it's smooth, it'll just rise up. And then it gives the water a chance to kind of slowly sink into the ground. Uh, French drains are often used for um, if you have drainage issues or if you have too much water at your foundation or something like that, but it can also be used for passive rainwater harvesting. You're basically just capturing water off your roof, down your um, gutter and downspout underground, and then it's released into an area where you potentially want that water. Next, we have rain gardens. Rain gardens are constructed to be able to receive a lot of water, a lot of runoff, um, and they're planted and it basically looks like a garden, but it's a garden that can be inundated by water and then it allows that water to infiltrate into the soil and into the ground. Here's another one. This is um, uh, up by New Belgium, up in Fort Collins. And you can see it's right off a um, parking lot. So parking lots get lots of runoff because it's it's impervious surface, there's nowhere for the water to go. And if the water can go into this rain garden and infiltrate in, it's great because they use plants and soils um, and the roots of the plants 
and microbes to slow and actually treat that stormwater runoff. So the, the water that comes off the parking lot can be pretty nasty. And by the time it moves through the rain garden, it's much, much cleaner. So rain gardens are pretty cool. If you're interested in this, um, you can check out the Stormwater Center at CSU, Google that, and they've got some resources for rain gardens. And there are a few kind of rules. You wanna make sure that, um, you know, you keep a rain garden at least 10 feet from buildings, 35 feet from septic tanks, 50 feet from water wells. You know, you don't wanna have a high concentration of water in the wrong spot. But if it's just going out into an open area that doesn't have other stuff going on, that can be a great spot for a rain garden. Okay, now we're gonna look at some plants. Um, I'm not going through spe a specific plant list, but just how to think about plants that you choose. There was a study done, it was 20 years ago now, um, but in Colorado Springs that compared water use between sort of more traditional plants uh, and xeric landscapes. And the water savings range from 15 to 63%. So that's a huge range, right? We don't have all of the information about what was there before and, and how much change took place. But even if you were on the low end of that and you were saving 15% of the water that you typically put down, that's a win. So Thinking about xeric plants is uh, a great idea, especially here in the arid west, where water is um, one of our most precious resources. Native plants and their cultivars often top the list of xeric plants. Um, I like to incorporate native plants into landscapes. They use fewer resources typically. Um, they still need maintenance and they still need water. Um, but you often don't have to amend your soils quite as much or fertilize. And they also support um, local wildlife, pollinators and songbirds and things like that. So um, again, when you're thinking about your plants, they can really, um, they can really work for you. So you want to make sure that you've got seasonal interest. You can see those gardens. Um, it's not the same garden, but still pictures taken spring, summer, fall, and winter, and there's interest going on. So we don't have to have any period of the year where our gardens are put to bed and we're just not thinking about it. Ornamental grasses, certain perennials and shrubs can look really beautiful throughout the fall and winter. Again, you think about color and texture. Um, looking at function, so uh, when I said they can work for us, if you live next to a busy street, for example, um, you can um, use certain plant material to block that noise and um, sort of screen that out. You can use them for visual screens. If you've got, I don't know, a billboard or a messy neighbor or something, you can use plants to screen that. Of course, you can use plants for um, food to feed yourself or to feed wildlife. So all of these different things that plants can do for us. You do want to make sure that you choose plants that fit your capacity and willingness to do maintenance. So having a garden means that you're going to have some sort of landscape maintenance to do. And if you don't have a lot of time, you just have a little bit of time on the weekends, then you want to choose plants that aren't going to take a lot of work and a lot of maintenance. If you've got all the time in the world um, and you love to garden, then you can choose plants that are going to require more maintenance. Really, really important when you're thinking through plants uh, and your plant palette that things grow. And you know, you might have to, where you plant them. Here we've got the, the trees with the power lines growing through them. You don't wanna pick those, you wanna pick shorter trees. Uh, you don't wanna plant really tall evergreens right in front of windows that are gonna block. You wanna have a more open space like that. So again, just thinking through that. The issue with this here is they've got some pretty ornamental grasses, but they're hanging out into the sidewalk. You can see down here, these ones haven't been cut back, but they're hanging into the sidewalk and making the sidewalk too narrow. So they have to chop these back and then they don't look good. So you really wanna think through all that. Again, this shrub, way too big, had to be sheared. Now it just has a funny little haircut or funny little hairdo with blooms just on top. I'm starting to go quickly. Sorry, I'm gonna run over a little bit. Um, microclimates are really important. You can create microclimates. Um, I commented a little bit about those, but you can grow different plants in different microclimates. So again, just if you've never heard that term, you can, you can look that up and uh, 
under, start to understand how those can, can work for you more. With irrigation, um, you wanna think about if you're gonna have drip or sprinkler, or if you're gonna hand water everything, that's all part of your landscape design. And you have to have an irrigation plan, um, whether it's no irrigation or some irrigation, you have to think through that. Super important to remember that you have to adjust um, your irrigation as plants mature, especially with things like trees that get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, when you first plant a tree, people put the irrigation right at the root ball, but over the years you have to spread that irrigation out because the roots spread out. Hydrozones are important to think about with irrigation and that's irrigation done by area rather than by plant. So you wanna group plants together with similar water needs um, and then irrigate them appropriately. You can still have plants that um, like a lot of water. We recommend putting them sort of close to the house so that they're easy to water. And then you can move away um, with more and more xeric plants. And then permeable pavers are something to think about. Again, trying to get water into the soil and into the ground and not just running off. So this is the gardens on Spring Creek. They've got their flagstone pavers. Um, and the spaces in between the pavers, again, are gonna let water infiltrate just a couple of different styles and, and aesthetics there. You can create a gigantic chessboard, that's fun. Um, and then finally, I think it's fun to incorporate garden art and some whimsy into your site. Um, that can be through found objects. A lot of people will use like old farm equipment pieces. You can add, actually have like beautiful sculptures like that glass sculpture, or even a bird bath can, can be a different kind of focal point and tie into your landscape design. So now I just have a few um, resources that you can use if you want some design ideas or help plant select it has some already created designs, you can go to their website and download those either use them for inspiration get some ideas for what plants work well together, or you can actually use them as um, as they are. Um, on the CSU Extension website, there are some native plant uh, low water garden guides for all five regions of the state. Again, you can Google those. Here's an example of what you get there. You're going to have pictures of all the plants and little sample designs. And if any of you are thinking about trying to figure out if you want to hire a professional or do this yourself, um, I still encourage you to go through all those steps that I outlined because it's going to it's going to make you a better customer and it's going to help the designer help you more because you kind of you're already sort of speaking the same language. You've figured out what you like and what you don't like, um, and it's just going to make the conversation and the process go better. Um, it's really important to, if you can kind of interview the designers, if they have a portfolio, check out their style and the work that they've done and make sure you have a good match. It's also important to know and understand what they're going to provide. Sometimes people get, um, they hire a designer and they get to a certain point and they, the customer thinks it's going to go further, but in fact, it's not. So understanding that um, what they're actually committing to in whatever bid they're giving you and just really understanding what you'll get for your money. And then if you're going to, um, if you're looking for designers, you can check out the Association of Professional Landscape Designers, APLD.org. You can get to their, navigate to their find a designer. You put your address in and it'll pull up um, people that are registered with them. Same thing with the American Society of Landscape Architects. So that's landscape architects versus landscape designers. It depends on your project. Most people can use landscape designers, but if you have anything that's really technical, um, certain um, like, um, like retaining walls or, or areas that need to sort of be engineered, a landscape architect might be a better bet. And then finally through ALCC, the Associated Landscape Contractors of Colorado. They have a find a pro kind of similar to the um, APLD where you can put in your address and find people that are near you. So with no time to spare, I will um, finish with this quote that is from Frederick Law Olmsted, who um, is considered the father of American landscape architecture. Um, his birthday was just a few days ago. Uh, he, I think he would have been 200 this year. He was the designer of Central Park and other famous parks in the East Coast. 
Uh, and he said, good garden design employs the mind without fatigue, tra tranquilizes yet enlivens it, and thus gives the effect of refreshing rest and reinvigoration. So getting outside, being in, in well-designed spaces is, um, is not only fun, but it's also good for us. So thanks everybody for your time. And um, if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>